not gonna be no killing without you. Do what all we say. Definitely not gonna be any killing without you. It's a case that's captured national headlines. We have to go to the roof. We have to go to the cause. You see me, I've been true to my colors forever, green and gold. But he has the evidence he needs on the tapes. And when you don't respect me, I'm gonna spank your ass. What up, family? It's your boy SCN TV. Back at y'all with another International Steppers. And this episode is gonna be about none other than Alexander Cooper, aka Ghost. Alexander Cooper, one of the most prolific gangsters of all time. Alexander Cooper was one of the first ones to master the art of deception. He actually worked on the south side of Chicago for the state as a garbage collector for years and years before the police ever figured out that he was running a drug enterprise. Ghost was a garbage man making $11.92 an hour by day and a kingpin making $50,000 a day by night. His network stemmed from Chicago to East Chicago all the way to Gary, Indiana. And he specialized in moving heroin and cocaine. Cooper mostly had his brothers Gerald and Segment running the day-to-day -day operations. It was like a family business. He even had his cousin and his sister overseeing his money. His main area of operation was from 79th to 81st in Cottage Grove. According to police, he only had the job as a garbage collector, strictly as a front. He would wait months at a time before even cashing the checks. Cooper had almost a 10-year run before things went left. A guy that went by the name of Robert Parker, who had been working for Cooper since 1983, investing and laundering money, ended up talking to the police. It is unclear why he started informing for the police, but it's most definitely a fact. Once Robert Parker started talking to the police, members of the crew became suspicious. When it became obvious that Parker was a rat, the crew decided they had to get rid of him. And it would only be a matter of time. In 1983, Robert Parker started working for Alexander Cooper laundering and investing proceeds from Cooper's drug enterprise. In July 1988, Parker contacted the Internal Revenue Service for the purpose of providing detailed information concerning Cooper's financial assets and drug trafficking. This contact eventually led to federal agents setting Parker up as an informant operating from an office and apartment at the Durrell Plaza in Chicago's Loop area. From the Durrell, federal agents planned to monitor Cooper's drug enterprise. Cooper discovered that Parker was acting as an informant for the government and began making arrangements to get rid of him. Cooper met several times with high-level members of his organization, including Anthony Davis, regarding the problem Parker posed to the organization. On the evening of February 6, 1989, Cooper had other members of his organization pick Parker up at the Durrell and transfer him to the Stop Restaurant, located at 6607 South King Drive, Chicago, Illinois. After a brief conversation with Cooper, Parker and Davis left the restaurant together. Shortly before midnight, Parker's body was discovered laying by the curb and on the Chicago street. He had been shot five times, twice in the head with a 380 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Federal agents arrested Cooper on July 23, 1989. At the time of his arrest, Cooper had in his possession almost $130,000 in cash, approximately $150,000 in jewelry, travel documents for Brazil and Nigeria, and false identification, including an application for a passport and a false name. On July 24, 1989, Pursuant to a search warrant, Chicago police searched Davis' apartment. The police found cocaine, drug paraphernalia, a loaded 357 Magnum revolver, a 22 caliber rifle, an empty 380 caliber ammunition box, and pictures of Davis posing with guns. On May 24, 1990, federal agents arrested Davis. Appellants Anthony Davis and Alexander Cooper, along with 19 other defendants, were named in a 62 count indictment. The indictment named Davis in four counts, conspiracy to distribute narcotics, intentional killing of Robert Parker, killing of a witness, and possession of cocaine. The indictment named Cooper in the majority of the 62 counts, following the voluntary dismissal of several counts and the filing of a superseding indictment, 
Cooper was charged as follows. One count of conspiracy to distribute narcotics, one count of engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise, one count of intentionally inducing the killing of Robert Parker, one count of causing the killing of a witness, one count of soliciting the murder of a witness, five counts of possession with the intent to distribute cocaine and heroin, four counts of distribution of cocaine and heroin, 24 counts of using a telephone to facilitate a federal felony, three counts of persuading grand jury witnesses to evade legal process, two counts of hindering others from communicating with the law enforcement officers, one count of making false statements to secure a passport, one count of attempting to prevent the testimony of witnesses, and two counts of making false statements on tax returns. On May 10, 1990, the government filed a notice of intent to seek the death penalty against Cooper and Davis for counts two and three. On January 7, 1991, the district court judge ordered separate trials for Cooper and Davis. On March 7, 1991, the jury in Cooper's trial found him guilty of all counts charged with the exception of a not guilty finding on count 23 and no finding as to count four. The trial court held a death penalty hearing pursuant to 21 USC. And on March 15, 1991, the jury did not unanimously find that the court should sentence Cooper to death. On March 19, 1991, the district court sentenced Cooper to 20 years for count seven, 18, 25, 29, 36, 37, 41, 43 and 46, 10 years for counts 49 to 53 and 59, 5 years for counts 54, 4 years for counts 9 through 14, 17, 20 through 22, 27, 28, 32, 35, 39, 40, 42, 44, 45, 47, and 48, 3 years for counts 61 and 62, and life imprisonment for counts 1, 2, and three of the second superseding indictment. When it was all said and done and the smoke cleared, the indictment dropped in 1989 and everybody was facing jail time in his organization, including Alexander's mother, Bertha, his two brothers, Gerald and Sigmund, his sister, Juanita, and his cousin, Christina. It will later come out that the females in Alexander's family played minor roles in his organization and locking the females up and charging them was just a tactic that was used to try to get Alexander to confess. And I think that what we can learn from the story of Alexander Cooper is this. Sometimes you gotta know when to hold and sometimes you gotta know when to fold. Alexander Cooper had the perfect plan. He got away for a decade. And all of a sudden, somebody who was loyal to his organization for so many years decided to flip and everything went south. You got to understand when you out here in these streets that things can change at the wink of an eye and at the drop of a dime, you can go from living the high life to facing life without in jail. Before Alexander Cooper, the police had never seen nothing like this. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even on their radar. But he should have quit while he was ahead. Because when he did get on their radar, they ended up making him pay. He ended up with life plus 42 years. Which means that 9 times out of 10, he'll never see the light of day. Let this be a lesson to everybody who thinks that they getting over. In the end, you always lose. Alexander's biggest mistake was killing that informant. If he would have never did that, he would have still got locked up, but he may not have got so much time. But like I said, you gotta know when to hold, and you gotta know when to fold. And sometimes you gotta learn when to count your blessings and move ahead. This has been another International Steppers. It's your boy, SNTV. I'm out.